Hi, thank you for taking the time to click on the link to hear more about my research. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Katherine Brzezinski. I'm a PhD candidate in the Materials Engineering Department at the University of Dayton in Ohio. And today I'll be discussing my research on flexible substrates with percolating graphite networks for improved performance of flexible, high power electronic devices. Quite a lengthy name. So I think now more than ever, our society is really reliant on technology and electronics. So this idea of ambient computing, which connects the internet of things with machine learning and artificial intelligence is not that far fetched. It's the idea that everything we interact with will have some sort of electronic device or sensor that will be collecting data and making decisions on that data. So this means there'll be devices on things like our disposable food packaging, crops in a farmer's field, as well as the bridges that we drive over. So this is gonna require that electronic devices move away from being rigid to more conformal and flexible while maintaining their low cost and reliability. I think Dr. John Rogers out of Northwestern has done some really great work on this front. The specific um, example that I have here is his flexible ECG monitor which is able to eliminate the need for that mess of wires that we're probably more familiar with um, in a hospital setting. This device can transmit the data through the air, but because of the materials that are being used, it is very much limited to low power operation, meaning that the data being sent can only go a few feet within a patient's room. If on the other side, we think about a high power device, like Google's wearable watch named Soli, shown here. It uses millimeter wave radar, which is a high power operation of an electronic device. So it's able to detect the, your fingers moving in the air from left to right, rather than requiring you to actually touch a screen, which is pretty cool. However, again, because of the materials that are being used, it is really bulky and rigid. And so these two examples really just highlight how rare, even in the state of the art, of the art electronics, it is to get both high power operation and flexibility. And so you might be asking, well, why is that? And from my point of view, it is simply a materials limitation or issue. And so it's important to think back on the silicon transistors that we've relied on since their invention in the 1970s. Their development has largely followed Moore's law due to miniaturization. However, one of the trends that's not often talked about is its operating power. So power of an electronic device is simply just like the work that can be done or the current times the voltage. And so you can see there in gray that the power limitations have really reached a plateau since the 2000s. And so a transistor is just a switch. It turns current on and off, which is how we get our ones and zeros. And when the current is flowing and the charge carriers are moving, they lose some of their energy as heat, which is a fundamental issue with all electronics. And it's really this thermal concern that is limiting the operation of these powers. And this is why we have this plateau in the operating power of our silicon-based devices. So if we want to get to higher power applications, we're going to have to look at materials other than silicon. These are things like the wide band gap materials like silicon carbide or gallium nitride, which combines both high power density and high frequency operation to send data far and fast. It's being used in applications such as our 5G wireless communications that is coming to market right now with the iPhone 12, as well as a variety of other military and space-based communication systems. I've been lucky enough to work with this flexible gallium nitride material that was developed at the Air Force Research Labs. It's a gallium nitride heterostructure, which is grown on a sapphire wafer, but what is unique is that it has this two-dimensional boron nitride layer in between that acts as a release layer. This means we're able to process these devices and pattern them in the clean room like we would any other device. So we have high quality materials, high performance, pattern devices and high power devices as well. But because of that two dimensional boron nitride layer, we're able to release that thin GAN film device from its rigid sapphire wafer. 
This means we have a low profile device, which correlates directly correlates to a lighter weight device. So when you imagine these transistors are being used with hundreds or thousands of them in our circuitry, that directly um, correlates to huge um, weight savings and for space-based applications or aerospace applications that directly correlates to huge fuel cost savings. Furthermore, because these devices are the thin to micron thin, they're also flexible and conformal, meaning we can imagine them to be integrated in areas that we would normally never even imagine. So these are things like the wearable devices or on a curved surface like a fuselage. And I mentioned that these can be removed from their rigid uh, wafers, so that means they're also transferable. And so we're able to transfer them to whatever substrate we would like. And some great work by, out of our group by Dr. Mike Matola published a paper earlier this year where he's really investigating the effect of that substrate has on the device operation. So if I call your attention to that middle bottom graph shown here, if he is able to transfer it from the sapphire wafer to a silicon carbide wafer, we see that that high thermal conductivity silicon carbide a wafer directly correlates to lower operating temperatures, even at higher powers, shown here in green. Where if instead we transfer it to a polymeric substrate, a flexible substrate like Kapton, we see that the operating temperatures are much higher at much lower powers. And it also required an adhesive layer, which is really just compounding this entire um, issue due to the addition of that interface and more thermal resistance. And so this will be a reoccurring theme in my talk. I'm going to um, keep bringing up the effect of the substrate and its effect on the device performance. And so the, the goal of my research is to actually improve or maintain the device performance by developing a substrate that is also flexible. And so I started by looking at what types of materials are currently used in electronic device packaging. So there's a, a silicon-based device on a silicon wafer where all the heat is generated, but there's also a cap um, that keeps the dust out or um, the other thermal management systems like the heat sink to help dissipate the heat. And so these materials are shown in this graph here in black. They're things like the silicon wafer, but also the aluminum heat sink. And these materials are high thermal conductivity materials, which is great from the thermal aspect, but they're also high modulus, meaning they're stiff materials. And so they're not going to be able to withstand a lot of strain or be incorporated in these flexible electronic applications. So instead, if we look to literature and see what is being used as a flexible substrate, these are materials like shown here in blue. They're typically polymeric, things like PET, Kapton, which is just polyimid, or silicone, which is um, polydimethylsiloxane or PDMS. These materials have much lower moduluses, meaning they're flexible, which is great, but they also have very low thermal conductivities, rarely getting up above one watts per meter Kelvin, which can be a concern um, for electronic device operation. And so what you're going to see in the coming slides is that I was able to improve the thermal conductivity of PDMS using graphite, shown here in red, um, while maintaining um, the low modulus. And so this is a high thermal conductivity material that's also flexible. And so I started um, by looking at the effect of different fillers as they had on the thermal conductivity of the PDMS composite. So I looked at all different forms of carbon, you know, low, high aspect ratio, things like CNTs, graphene, graphite, as well as some silver nanoparticles to better understand their effect on the thermal conductivity. And so if we look there in red at the silver nanoparticles, you can see that even at high loadings, we had a very minimal, if any, enhancement in thermal conductivity. And so why is this? It's, it's twofold, really. It's the fact that these are spherical nanoparticles, so they have an aspect ratio of one, which is very low. And from theoretical calculations, you wouldn't expect a thermally conductive network to upwards of 22 volume percent, meaning we need even more fillers to really capitalize on a, a high thermal conductivity composite. Furthermore, these are metal nanoparticles, meaning they're dense, and they actually agglomerated at the bottom of the casting 
during cure due to gravity, as shown there in the SEM um, cross-sectional image. Graphite, on the other hand, is carbon-based, so it's much lighter, and it was able to stay well dispersed in the casting during cure. Furthermore, these are nano, or these are platelets, and so they have a high aspect ratio, which we're really able to capitalize on. So let's look at that a little bit further. So these graphite flakes have a high aspect ratio, and so we're really able to create this percolating thermally conductive network um, at much lower loadings. So from percolation theory, it suggests that there's this threshold known as the percolation threshold. So below which you see this linear trend with thermal conductivity as you increase the filler content. However, as you get above the percolation threshold, in this case at six volume percent, you see the sharp increase in thermal conductivity. And so it's the fact that these are high aspect ratio flakes that were able to get a pretty low percolation threshold and really capitalize on being able to improve the thermal conductivity so drastically at low loading. So we're able to improve the thermal conductivity by more than 800% from 0.2 watts per meter Kelvin, which is typical for PDMS, to upwards of 1.8 watts per meter Kelvin at, at only 11 volume percent, which is about half of what is theoretically um, the theoretical percolation threshold for spherical particles. We see this idea of percolation occur in other properties as well. I'll call your attention over to the electrical conductivity. We see a sharp increase in electrical conductivity after six volume percent, as well as um, a sharp increase in stiffness after six volume percent. If instead we look um, not to a different chemical type of filler, but a, just a different size of filler. Here I have um, the graphite flakes that were shown on the previous slide here in black and compared those to much larger flakes, so about double in size, and saw that the larger graphite flakes that have the higher aspect ratio have further enhanced the thermal conductivity. And so this means they're creating a percolating network at much lower filler contents which makes sense. And it also makes sense that there's less filler, um, actual flakes in that percolating network with these larger flakes. And so because there's less flakes, there's less um, interfaces, meaning there's less interfacial resistance or um, heat conduction resistance between the flakes in that um, composite network. And so this results in a higher thermal conductivity enhancement. However, because these are stiff, um, Graphite flakes, they also drastically increase the viscosity. So we were unable to create samples that were have filler contents higher than five volume percent for these large flakes shown here in red. And so that means the highest composite substrate we are able to get with these larger flakes has a thermal conductivity of 1.2 watts per meter Kelvin. Compared to the flakes that are smaller, we're able to get a much higher filler content and get a higher composite thermal conductivity of 1.8 watts per meter Kelvin. So for the rest of the talk, when I talk about a PDMS composite, I'm really gonna focus in on the sample of 1.8 watts per meter Kelvin with 11 volume percent of these 50 micron graphite flakes. And so one last um, material property that I wanna talk about is the maximum use temperature of these composite materials. Um, we know that polymeric materials are not necessarily used in high temperature operation um, applications, so I really wanted to understand what that limit was. So from TGA, I found that there's a 2% weight loss of this composite at 300 degrees C, which is relatively high when we think about other polymeric materials, specifically those used in flexible substrates, with the exception of polyimmin. Also, compared to the expected operating temperature of electronic devices, this is still um, a, a good use temperature. Typically, devices operate for silicon at 250 max, and this is for high um, performance applications used in military um, and wearable devices and you know, more flexible applications. We are expected to have those devices operating at much lower. And again, for the GAN, uh, GAN, flexible GAN devices, I expect, again, that the maximum operating temperature will be much lower than 300 C. So this um, composite use temperature of 300 C is um, still applicable for this application. And so now kind of just combining the two topics that I've been um, discussing, these 
composite, flexible composite um, substrate materials with the flexible gallium nitride transistors. And so I was successful in transferring these devices to both PDMS and the PDMS composite substrate without the need for an adhesive layer, which is really exciting. It's specifically the first to demonstrate this transfer process without an adhesive layer to a composite substrate, which is really exciting. Um, all other literature sources have to use an adhesive layer for this. Um, and that adhesive layer is just, again, one more interface, one more place for thermal resistance to occur. And so I, bet I wanted to understand the effect of these substrates on the device performance. And so I started by looking in the infrared camera to better understand that relationship between operating power and peak temperature. And so from the graph on the left, you can see our experimental data is plotted as data points and the console model is shown there as dashed lines. And they're both in pretty well agreement in the overall trend that the device that is transferred to the enhanced thermo thermal conductivity substrate, the PDMS composite, heats up much slower than the device on a traditional flexible substrate, the PDMS substrate. Specifically at 30 milliwatts, we see a 24 degree decrease in temperature, which is huge. Um, using a common rule of thumb, this is expected to double the lifetime of the device. So from a reliability standpoint, this is a huge improvement. If instead we look at this data in another way and we say, hey, uh, I did, as a design engineer, which is probably more typical for like electronic packaging, they set a maximum operating temperature. So in this case, uh, I don't want the device to operate at higher than 100 degrees Celsius. We see that the device on the enhanced thermal conductivity substrate, the PDMS composite, is able to operate at 60% more power than the device on the traditional flexible substrate, the PDMS. And so I know you just heard that. I just want to amplify this statement for dramatic effect. The device on the enhanced thermal conductivity substrate is operating at higher powers than the device on a traditional substrate, which is huge. That was one of the goals of this research was to allow these devices to operate at higher powers while maintaining their flexibility. And so one other thing that I want to point out here, I'll draw your attention to these heat maps. So the device on the thermal conductivity substrate on the low thermal conductivity substrate, the PDMS, the heat is unable to move or conduct away because it is a low thermal conductivity. And so the heat is just staying where the heat is being generated here in the channel where all the charge carriers are moving, where all the device on the enhanced thermal conductivity substrate, the PDMS composite, the heat is able to move laterally and conduct away from the channel where all the heat is being generated. And this is what is the result of these this is a direct result of why there is these lower operating temperatures. And so just to drive home the substrate effect, I want to bring up these device characteristic curves, which are probably more familiar to electrical engineers, but I promise I'll walk you through it. it it's not that difficult. And so a transistor is just a switch. So as we turn the current on by applying a drain voltage, we see this increase in drain current where it eventually reaches a maximum and plateaus. And this maximum current is known as the saturation current. And the saturation current directly follows the thermal conductivity of the substrate um, trend. And so if you have a high thermal conductivity substrate, you're gonna have high saturation current as the case with the PDMS composite, you have a much higher saturation current than the the device on the traditional flexible substrate, in this case, the PDMS. And so one other thing to point out is that the device on the PDMS substrate actually fails at very low um, drain voltages and powers, represented here by the X. And so this is not great um, for these devices to fail in normal operation. And so this just suggests that the, the traditional flexible substrates are not going to be able to be used for these flexible gallium nitride materials. Also, I want to point out that the PDMS composite is about 20 times lower um, in thermal conductivity 
than this a rigid sapphire wafer, but we do not see that same scaling in the saturation current, which is really surprising and um, just highlights that even though the PDMS composite is much lower in thermal conductivity, it has a huge effect on its device performance. And so you might be asking, well, why is the substrate effect um, occurring and it really ties back into the data that we saw previously with the operating temperature. So when the device is on a low thermal conductivity substrate, it has a higher operating temperature and because of that there's more increased scattering. And so this means the charge carriers are scattering and not moving as efficiently and this directly results in a lower saturation current. And so to really drive home this temperature effect, I um, looked at the device on a sapphire wafer shown on the graph on the right. And instead of changing the substrate, I changed the environment that the device is operating in. This means I increased the, the hot plate that the device was on or the operating environment from room temperature all the way up to 125C. And we see that it follows, again, increasing the temperature also decreases the saturation current, just really suggesting that scattering is one of the main modes um, for this reduction in saturation current and this temperature effect. And I think I've said it a few times that this PDMS composite is flexible, but I really wanted to demonstrate that. So here I have the devices on the PDMS composite, and I was able to create two uh, 3D print two bending jigs, um, a 33 millimeter and a 15 millimeter bend radii. And I bent the devices over a uh, hundred times over these um, radii and really saw no degradation in performance, either in the saturation current or the device characteristics for both cases. And this really just highlights the fact that this um, substrate and device are robust as a pair and they can withstand um, bending, they're flexible, as well as having an improved thermal conductivity and an improved performance. And so, with that, I hope I was able to. Uh, demonstrate that I developed a flexible substrate that acts like a flexible heat sink for high power flexible electronics. I was able to do this by enhancing the thermal conductivity of PDMS using graphite flakes by more than eight times. This resulted in enhanced performance of these devices on this composite substrate as compared to typical flexible substrates and that performance was maintained during cyclic bending. And with that, I want to thank you as an audience, as well as Dagzi and Soshi for their continued financial support, and my PhD committee members, specifically my advisor, Dr. Christopher Miratori, as well as all the wonderful scientists and engineers that I get to work with at the Air Force Research Labs in the Materials and Manufacturing Directorate and the Sensors Directorate. And with that, I want to thank you. And I really appreciate this opportunity and I hope we get to meet in real life one day soon. Thank you.